Uh, welcome to this afternoon's PTIC meeting, everybody. Um, it is uh, spring, technically, although it might not feel like it um, if you're in the north. Um, but uh, welcome to spring. Um, so I am Tim Rivet. I'm your host for today, uh, and I run Artig on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, we've not got too many people, so let's do a rundown. Uh, so uh, first on my list is Claire. That's all right. Uh, I don't think anybody else has stuck in. So. OK, uh, last time we met was just before Christmas um, and uh, Theresa circulated the uh, minutes of that a couple of days ago. Um, if there is anything inaccurate that you've noticed in them, then uh, shout out. Um, Theresa tries and helps us understand what actions are and opportunities are by colour coding. Um, so um, hopefully that will help make sure I pick everything up. So um, Ben and Dan, you were going to talk about service codes and registered um, references. Um, I don't know whether there's anything out of that to. Um... No, I don't think so. I think I'm trying to work out in my head what on earth that was all about now, going back all in months. I think it was, uh, I think it's trying to work out what the level of coverage was in BOD's timetables versus actual. I think there would be some numbers when we circulated around giving an idea about how much was in BOD's and how much wasn't being included as part of BOD's. That's yeah. what I that think sounds... I remember. But yeah. Christmas happened. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and linked to that, um, we were going to share some performance data on BODs in terms of coverage um, for uh, timetables and AVL. Various stats were shared last time, but um, I haven't um, sorted out how we make that available on a more regular basis, Ben. Perhaps that's something we should uh, pick up separately, unless you've got it published somewhere where we can point to. Well, we do have the time table data catalogue on BODs to get a view of the services which are published and whether they're and if they are published, whether they are up to date or not. However, we're just about to improve the data catalogue with um, some um, automated information about whether the services are in scope or not because currently it just lists everything that's available from the OTC um, and so it's not it's not a helpful source currently but we're, we're making an update soon so that that can be um, easily accessible by by any user logged in or not um, so I'll, I'll share the link to the current form of that of that um, document and it should be the, by the time you have this this call next time it has um, the region based rules in to to determine whether each registration is um, is in scope or not. And also by then it should also have the other registrations that are managed outside of the OTC by different enhanced partnerships. Uh, they, those should also be included in that as well. So that's those are other improvements that I'll, I'll talk a bit later about. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll share the link in the chat where you can see the current catalogue. But yeah, it's got a few gaps. That need addressing like i say in, in terms of whether it's in scope or not and also um those ones that are currently not not present that are um, published by the different enhanced partnerships yeah that sounds really positive thank you yeah um then there was an opportunity to engage with ben if you're an authority who've got operators that aren't providing data um so um that continues that opportunity, I'm presuming, if you've an authority will, with operators that aren't providing data to BODs um, to try and encourage them to supply. Um, likewise, um, 
feedback for improvements on reporting and releases for bods uh what other actions have we got then right um so um uh presume i guess this might be picked up uh in a bit but um opportunity to engage with bods team triumph and ben for reviews of sprints and um future opportunities the program board and stuff yeah there was the program boards and the sprint review boards and stuff i think we were thinking yeah. whether we could get dates or availability up somewhere yes yeah um they are available on the PTIC website, the links to the sprint reviews and uh, the Discord channel where lots of things tend to get promoted and things like that. So um, we did do that action. Um, and then we haven't got Mike on the call, Mike Baxter from Leicester on the call, um, but um he was going to talk to ben um then um under flexible services um if people are wanting uh have got questions about data and profile requirements then um please feel free to get in contact with me, that should say. Um, oh. So let me, let me know, he's me, he's Tim. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, Tim, yeah, okay, good point. Um, oh, and um, um, if you want to talk about bilingual data, um, then Mark jones in wales is the person to talk to um and um christmas data um which was picked up under travel line we've got an item on the agenda um eu standards development uh, if you want to get involved and some people did get in contact um, about the work that's about to start to standardise the LED displays on the front of a bus, the departure board type um, destination blind stuff, um, then um, yeah, that's uh, about to kick off and there's a few people that have got in contact and so uh, yeah, there's a bit of a going to be a bit of a UK working group feeding into the uh, Indian straight ISO standard stuff that's going on. So that's good. Um, and issues log, just the normal. Um, if you find a bug or a problem, then fill out the form on the website and um, it will go through the process of um, trying to fix it and consultation um, and all the stuff that needs to go into making standards um and we have had a point of accuracy um on page three uh bods have been talking to andrew varley not farley thank you okay um Anything else on the minutes? No, that takes us on to BODs. And I see since we did introductions, Triumph has joined us. Um, over to you, Triumph. Hi, Tim. Um, I had I didn't know I was going to be able to, to make this. I had a group with Ben to, to do the intros. Um, my meeting just got cancelled, hence the reason I can join. So over to you, Ben. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pass the parcel. <laughs> That's fine. Yep, I was expecting to. So I'm just going to get my screen ready. One minute. The dates on the previous slides are not accurate, but I'll, so I'll start from here. Um, can you see that full screen? Okay, does that look readable? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. So um, just to re uh, revisit the purpose, 
of, of BODS, why it exists, what it's trying to do. So it's um, um, it's data quality um, of, of transport data that uh, enables passenger improvements. Um, so data quality is achieved through three measures. Is it complete? Is it timely? And is it accurate? Um, this in turn, when it is all of those three things, enables passengers or enables passenger facing technologists to help passengers plan journeys, find the best value tickets and get real time uh, alerts um, wherever they are. So um, it's the passenger improvement, uh, the passenger experience that we want to improve. So uh, these are the, uh, the, the things that we are measuring and trying to trying to move towards. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, so we've been uh, since the last um, update in December, we've been making some changes to BODS to bring in the disruptions data from the disruptions tool. This will show the disruptions in a nice visual way. Um, some really good updates have been made, which will um, enable you to find the disruptions that exist um, that are created through the disruptions tool. Um, these were already available through the API on BODS, but but now you can use the user interface to to navigate around the map and the country to see where the disruptions are. Uh, if that's if that's helpful for you as a consumer, but also for different users that are wondering whether their disruptions are there, um, and to then talk to their local authority if they need to to get those on. That's something that can be enabled through this through this feature. So this is live and available now on BODS. Um, we've been working on the flexible services functionality. This update here is to um, take advantage of the update that we've got based on the NAPTAN data that we pull in. So we expanded the, the scope of the NAPTAN data that BODS ingests every night to understand not just all the stops, but also what are the stop types. Um, and, uh, and so therefore we can now do this, this verification that if a flexible services file is using a, a zone in the trans exchange file. We'll make sure it is that the, the code used in the trans exchange is an FLX stop. We're also bringing in all of the uh, positions that um, exist for that FLX stop. Um, and we'll be showing on BODS. I'll, I'll talk a bit, a, a bit later about what we're, what we're doing next, but uh, we're working on um, visualizing these zones and these shapes. Um, so uh, the, but the validation rules are all there, so data is um, is ready to be published to to BODS for flexible services. We're not. Uh, I'm glad Cody Garton on here are on here today. These will likely to be the first technology supplier to enable operators to publish this data to BODS. Um, so we're ready to validate it and feedback if there's any issues with that data now. Um, we've implemented service level pages, um, so this is where each individual service that exists within a within a data set that might contain many trans exchange files, there's a page for each service so, uh, with a map for it so that you can uh, begin to inspect the details of that. Um, we'll be iterating on this with additional data for each of these services and eventually with a timetable, but I'll, I'll talk about that bit, um, shortly. Um, but these service level pages are live now, so this means that um, for a large zip file that contains lots of data for lots of services, you can see the individual services that are present there and, and have a look at the details that, it, that exist for that service. Um, we've been improving the way that FAIRS data is handled. Uh, we've had some challenges that were, uh, that were impacting just a couple of operators, uh, but nonetheless important for us to address. So Carne data um, is now handled correctly. So this means that um, there are no currently um, outstanding work items for the for the current validation rules that we have on BODS. So um, those operators that are publishing FAIRS data should have a validation report that they can trust and act on. There should be no um, um, like pending issues to uh, you know to ignore, for example. So every issue that's present on the validation report can be addressed by working with their technology supplier to do so. Um, and finally, we've been improving the way that registrations are handled. Some operators were seeing some of their council services listed on the time every data catalog and and as as services that require attention. So we've been we've been addressing that and that, that's now improved and, and implemented as well. Um, so some upcoming features over the coming months. So we talked about the um, 
at the registrations from the enhanced partnerships. So Weka registrations are coming first. The team are um, just about to deploy that. We'll be deploying that before the end of March so that, that functionality can see all of the Weka registrations. Um, and we are with the with this release doing um, some additional functionality on the timetable data catalog that I was talking about that will um, supply the knowledge that we've got about each local transport authority that is um, associated with with each of the registrations from WECA and also the OTC. Um, this information is really helpful um, because it helps us understand a few things. It helps us understand what, what ATCO admin area it belongs to and also what region of the country it belongs to. Um, so there's going to be a, a few different ways to filter the time data data catalogue. We'll be able to filter by um, the local transport authority that you're interested in, um, or the admin area or areas plural that you're interested in, or the region of the country that you're interested in, and get a nice view of um, all of the services that belong to that region and whether they are healthy or not, whether they are published and if they are published, whether they are up to date or not. This also gives us that functionality I was talking about earlier, which determines whether they're in scope or not. So if it's um, if it's an English region, they'll be in scope. Um, if it's a Scottish um, service, which is only in the Scottish region and not a cross border service, then that will be out of scope. So this means that you'll be able to use the timetable data catalog as a whole to see all of the services that are in scope of the legislation for BODS and how healthy that data is. Uh, so this lends itself to really easy analytics, really straightforward uh, filtering to see the, the area that you're interested in or the country as a whole or individual regions of the country to see how healthy the data is for that for that region. Um, so we'll implement that those and those changes in March um, and then um, subsequently in April we'll be looking at um, in, in um, adding to that list of registrations those that belong to the other enhanced partnerships. So we're building a tool for TFGM, TFWM and Hertfordshire um, to upload their CSVs onto. They'll get some feedback about the um, about what that data looks like, what that CSV looks like, so that they can be sure that that CSV has been imported correctly. It will also give them a, a, a quick summary of whether the, all of the licenses that are present there are valid licenses as, as per the OTC um, state and view of those. So um, some helpful feedback to the enhanced partnerships on, on, on the data that they've uploaded to this tool. Um, and from there, it can be accessible by all sorts of um, websites and users like BODS and like BSOG so that they can have a view of all of the registrations that exist um, and, and that helps us give a complete view on BODS and other applications for all of the registrations that exist, not just those from the OTC. Um, and then we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming in May. We've got a, a kind of bump a few months leading up to up to May. So live uh, line level analysis is the first thing that we'll be doing. So in the in the time to data catalog it is currently at a service code level. It will be um, uh, separated out separated out so that it's at a line level. So this means that each individual line that is associated with a registration will be present on the time to data catalog and we'll be saying whether the data there is, is correct. Um, and this um, will uh, marry up with the um, line level or service level data set pages that we're doing um, and and further on these data, data set pages as I was talking about we'll be iterating on that and, and adding more information um, we'll be doing a few uh, two key things uh, the first is there will be visualized timetables um, so that you can see um, the trans exchange data in a human readable format so that you can check it for accuracy and second to that there will be some notes on that visualized timetable about the data quality checks that the bots has detected exist so if on your timetable you that you can that you look you can look at there might be an issue with the stop um, there might be an issue with the journey it might have some incorrect timings on there um, and so these will be uh, indicated on that timetable so that you've got that context of where the issues exist. So this will help local authorities and operators and consumers see where issues exist with the data by doing that eyeball accuracy check based on what they understand what the time should be, but also taking advantage of the uh, um, of the feedback that BOLS has detected automatically 
and this will help operators um, to address these and update the data and see all of those errors and those issues go one by one. Um, and I think something that will be helpful for a lot of operators is that the block number will not be a, a crucial uh, issue for the operators to address. That one will be um, 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 available to view where it is or it is not visible, but um, but it won't be listed as something which needs um, attention for that service. So if there are any data quality issues that are important for a service, it will require attention just in the same way it currently requires attention if it's missing or if it's out of date, um, but block numbers will not cause a service to um, be, require attention. OK, that's the summary I wanted to give. Happy for questions. Any questions? It sounds like you've got a busy few months, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a lot we want to do. Um, so, yeah, we're a bit daunted by the prospect, but really looking yeah. forward to getting these features live. Yeah, Keith, hi, man. You've got your hand up. Yeah, I'll just check out how I understood something of what you were saying in the last slide just now. Is there going to be a combined schedule or have you got a database of all registrations irrespective of who the registration authority is? Um, so there's good, that's going to be done in, in a couple of ways. Um, the, um, the, I'm calling it the EP portal, that's not going to be the name of it, it's going to be a devolved uh, registrations portal. Um, that will uh, um, enable there to be a, a single repository of all of the registrations that are made either by the OTC or through the enhanced partnerships um, and BODS will um, have its data aligning with that so that means that um, it will have all of the registrations from the OTC and all of the enhanced partnerships um, considered when we're marking services as requiring attention. Well, I, 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 I understand. Well, I don't entirely understand your answer because I'm not going to be all the tech behind it. But I mean, it's not, maybe not. It's, quite, it's not a question for you. Maybe it's a question we should address the DFT. So whether it's good now because previously when it was just the OTC, we had a single source of all bus service registrations in the country. Um, um, I'm not sure if Bond is going to be a substitute for that or not. But perhaps we'll address it to DFT. Um. So the, the devolved registrations portal will be a, a place where information about all registrations will be accessible. It will be accessible through an API and it will, there will be a user interface as well. So what this means is that you'll be able to query any registration, whether it was, um, was or is currently managed by the OTC or by an enhanced partnership. And it will give an info, uh, a history of um, each registration as well, so you'll be able to see all the variations that existed and if that history started at the OTC and it was since transferred to an enhanced partnership, you'll be able to see that history too. Um, and that all, all of that information will be available through this new um, uh, registrations um, uh, site that we're, that we're building that, yes, but that will be accessible through um, um, either through an API or, or through a user interface. Um, and yeah, it will import all of the registrations that, that are available through the OTC API. So it will import all of those and combine the history of all of those alongside the history that's that's obtained from the CSVs that are published from the different enhanced partnerships. So whether the registration is supplied either by CSV or by API, it will be subsequently presented in a nice single uh, repository to show to see all of the registrations alongside of each other in the history of each of those registrations. If you'd like to have a look at, at what that looks like in its early stages, what the designs look like, we'd be very happy to connect you to the teams. Uh, okay, I'll just put my question in the chat where it can be answered later. So it's not urgent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, John Carr. Yeah, um, you're on mute, John. I'm muted now. Um, better get this question in, otherwise there's a load of primary school kids back. <laughs> um, I'm just interested to know what feel you have for the number of operators that are currently able to supply fares data. Um, and secondly, what the um, uh, time scale is for rollout of this nationwide? Well, 
There's a couple of dimensions to that. I'll, I'll see whether I can get to the root of your question. Um, all operators are able to supply FAIRS data. Um, we have a free tool available, the Create FAIRS Data Service, which is available for an operator to, to go on and, and describe their FAIRS, and subsequently that will generate a machine readable file that can be published to BOD. So it's entirely accessible um, for every operator to use. Um, and around three quarters of all operators have found a way to, to generate and publish their data, uh, either through the free tool or, or by a supplier that they that they prefer. Um, so the, uh, the the functionality has been has been um, around for a while, and it it, it remains um, it remains available for for operators to describe their fares in a in a structure that's that meets a you know a national standard, the BODS standard that that Stephen Penn has just described um, uh, in in the recent documentation, so that. Um, Every consumer can access all of the fares data supplied by any operator in a in a nice standardised um, structured way. Yeah, that that's um, that's quite encouraging. I've uh, <laughs> in the past had occasions where the operators' fares tables were regarded as a state secret. But uh, <laughs> um, okay, but that that does sound quite good. Um, and secondly, the the timescale for complete rollout. Well, it's it's rolled out. The functionality is available. Um, we we have a few steps involved in the in the process. So uh, we will be iterating on the validation logic um, and working with technology suppliers that are now able to understand what a complete fares structure looks like, including all of the previously designated um, simple fares and also the complex fares. So, uh, but that will be. Um, complete by the end of this year. Um, but currently all operators are able to do this. Um, they um, they are doing so and they're maintaining their data and they're keeping their data up to date. And if they are not, um, we are talking to them to see if they need any help um, or if the enforcement agencies can can help to motivate them through the process. Thank you. Yeah, Dan. I, I guess to pick up on the enforcement, um, so obviously we're a bit behind on you know where people should be on uploading timetables and fares and things like that. Has anything been done with trying on the enforcement side of things? Are they uh, in getting operators to do it, or are we still uh, relying on kind of you know, cheering them along and you know helping them and kind of sticking to them? Yeah, you know, where where are we at with with that basically? Action has been taken. Um, I won't share the details, but they are available online to see. Um, so yeah, um, it's not like um, we're still waiting for that for that first kind of milestone to be reached. So yeah, action has been taken against okay, some cool. operators. Jolly good. Okay. Any more questions, Mike? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Ben. Uh, just on a sort of theme on the enforcement side of things, where you find where you do identify inaccuracies and that you will present that for all to see. Is there any kind of turnaround time to get it accurate? Or is there anything being done with that? So you're going to flag in inaccuracy. Is there anything in terms of the enforcement of then getting it corrected? Um, there is. It's around three months. Um, so in that window, the conversation is held and that support is offered um, and and that's the amount of time that's that's required to address um, you know the uh, the results of that initial conversation um, or the uh, the uh, the demand of that initial conversation so yeah there's a three month period that that is um, um, or a process that's that's carried out by the by the enforcement agencies to uh, to get them where they need to get to cool that's great thanks Ben I would like to so not disagreeing with Ben, but I would also like to caveat that um, a little. Um, so when it comes to enforcement and and of making data complete and more accurate, there is a, there is a dependence on you know other parties, the VSA for example, and ultimately the operator. So whilst three months is is, is an expectation. We are also dependent on other parties playing playing their role. So if at all a data is flagged up and in three months' time you come back and that data is not where it needs to be, I just you know need to caveat that we are dependent on other parties playing their role as well. Does that make sense?
that was probably to Mike. Uh, Mike, it's a, it's a help. <coughs> okay, um, Keith Willis then. So, um, can you hear me? Because I've got headphones, so I know yeah. they're working. Splendid. Um, so all the simple and complex flares are in bonds. Are there good examples of where it's actually been used by people so public see it and it's easier for them or is it just in bonds and not being used? Yeah, good question. And passenger are probably the most um, active um, and visible use of this. They have just rolled out. Uh, an update to their journey planner, which will enable passengers to see what the what the prices are for different journeys based on the NetEx fares data um, that's that's available. So, uh, yeah, this this fares data is is now used by passengers to see um, what the journey will cost before they before they think about uh, that's the start of that journey. Okay, and is it expected to be both online and at ticket machines and consistently? Just when you read about that, you know, it's cheaper online if you buy something compared to a ticket machine or so forth. This is a way of making sure that ticket machines are up to date with the same information you can get online. I mean, a person going to a ticket machine, if you see what I mean? I think so. Let me just play it back a little bit. So there's different ways to buy a ticket. You can buy it on the bus or you can buy it online or buy it through an app. Uh, and all these different ways of buying a ticket um, are um, it can be described in the in the fare structure, uh, and if there are different prices for those, that can be described too. So this means that if you are if you are a journey planner, you can you can provide that information if you if you decide to, um, or you might just decide to simplify it and just show the most expensive version of that ticket. Um, so yeah, the the detail um, is available and can be accommodated um, in these in these files. Um, and then it's for the consumers to decide the best way to to present that information to their to their users, whoever that might be. OK. Thank you, Triumph and Ben. Um, if we move on now to Travel Line, um, that's probably the uh, point mike hello yeah thanks tim yeah we'll keep brief just a couple of updates from the travel line part of the world so i think one of the uh, biggest bits we've been working on recently is we're about to go out to market for the procurement of our uh, suite of, of websites so the full travel line uh, list of websites so this is the front end not our back end journey planner it's the very much the customer facing side uh, so that'll include travelline.info the travel line data site the .mobi site and plus bus so we're looking in there for new look and feel bringing the family of sites uh, together improving functionality so looking at bringing in the fares data uh, that ben and stephen have been talking about and triumph uh, also disruptions uh, information we'd like to see um, in there as well as some enhanced content and linking to some of our other areas of work where we make we're, we're kind of trying to promote various days out and, and uh, attractions so we're looking to go to the market in the next few weeks um probably will strain to April I would imagine um, and then we're going through the full procurement process so we'll be doing uh, advertising doing a, a an RFI PQQ the full stages and then we'll be assessing bids with a view to later in the year um, announcing who's won that and then obviously subsequent development we can inform you of time scales from then um, so that's the kind of the big bit we've, we've kind of been working on um, we're also extending the partnership uh, with uh, Good Journey Good Journey who many of you will be aware a consortium um, of organizations who promote car free days out via their website We've been working with them over the last couple of years uh, in terms of promoting days out in plus bus areas and also negotiating discount attractions and venues. So we've extended that partnership for the next couple of years uh, to get more content. And again, we'd like to see that content into the journey planner. So when people are planning journeys, we're giving them the full end to end journey plan, fares information disruption, and also some ideas of where they could go uh, while out and about on those journeys. So kind of enhancing the, the user experience um, with the professionals that do that. And we've also been working with Alidium uh, and our existing suppliers on assessing the kind of uh, completeness and quality of BODS data with a view to, for some of the larger operators of ingesting BODS data um, and then outputting that into TNDS. So we've, we've, we're kind of making some good progress on that. We've, the completeness is looking uh, for a couple of operators is looking in, 
you know, relatively good. Uh, we have identified a couple of issues just with stale data that are on board. So we're working through how we may manage that and how we may process the data. We might say present that in TND. So we'll continue that work uh, over the next couple of months and uh, hopefully we'll report back uh, the next meeting of, of progress on that one. Uh, in the Plus Plus part of the world, uh, we just stood up our interim Plus Plus website. Uh, the Plus Plus website, as mentioned, will be getting re-procured as that uh, through that travel line procurement. Um, we've had to stand up an interim uh, version of the site as our previous supplier, unfortunately, uh, went out of business. Uh, so we've been able to do that. And we've also hooked into existing systems that we've, we've shown previously on this call that we developed a, a map cutting and fares system uh, back in the last year. And we're able to now use the data within there to actually, we've set up a, a, a combination of APIs which enable us to feed the, the information on the website so a fairly cute in, in, uh, interim solution but we are looking at getting a slicker version as we kind of go forward uh, in the procurement and the other big bit of news uh, around Plus Bus is the uh, Travel Line and Plus Bus board have approved uh, who's rolling out the e-ticketing trial um, so we are going to be rolling that out at six locations across the UK uh, in its first iteration, it will be the ticket will be used as a flash pass and we'll be using the six trial areas to develop uh, the functionality we need with suppliers. So we're working with Ticketer and also a number of talks uh, in terms of validating the ticket on ETMs and also suppressing NFC, which is an issue in TOC and real retailer apps. So we've identified the six locations. I can't announce them at the minute because we're still confirming arrangements with those of who's going to be taking part. But we will have we have got at least six, we think, uh, who are willing to kind of go forward with that. And our idea is ideally we'd like to get that rolled out in April uh, with a bit of a quiet launch and then look to do a bit of a bigger bang. Uh, there's still some unknown steps in there because it's, it's kind of Virgin territory this so we're, we're kind of uh, we're stepping our way through it uh, as we go hence the, the need to do it as a flash pass but hopefully yeah April is the kind of working date that we're looking to do that it, if we probably say for the minutes uh, say spring as Tim said spring started today and it gives us a bit of time uh, to raise if that's all right but yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, the big yeah, news and we should we should be able to give some firmer uh, milestones mm -hmm. of that hopefully the next meeting we've actually got some some live uh, schemes in there Tim I'll pass back to you for any questions yeah. Anybody got any questions for Mike? Mike's busy as well. Everybody's doing lots of stuff at the moment. Very too busy, exciting. Tim. Too busy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> any questions for Mike? No. It might it might just be me, but but sometimes it's it's helpful to ask a silly question. Others may benefit. There's a couple of terms there that I didn't I didn't understand. Um, flash pass and talks, if you don't mind. Like. Absolutely, but yeah, so flash pass is uh, literally just when a, a, you flash a ticket to the driver, so you show a ticket to the driver. Right. So the way that Plus Plus currently works is that it's printed on paper stock and they show that to the driver. It's not scanned or validated on a ticket machine. It's just shown and that's where the term flash pass comes from. So the e-ticket will be delivered via a smartphone. It will have a QR code on it and various flashing bits and pieces, but you would show that to the driver rather than scanning it. Uh, Verified on the, by the machine. driver. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, driver verification. So yeah, yeah, the, the kind of log sign is flash pass. Uh, regards to top, that's train operating company. So that's the likes of uh, LNER, Northern, uh, cross country. So yeah, train operating company. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. No problem. Uh, John. Hi, you, you referred to problems with NFC uh, and that put me in mind the um, Samsung phone that I'm currently using whenever it seems to get the opportunity and it's got an Oyster card near to it it tries to uh, load it as an NFC yeah uh, is that a general problem with Android phones or is it just uh, this particular one no, so the, the, the issue is, is quite universal, John. So the, the main issue we've got is that Ticketer are the main supplier of ETM uh, across the country. The way the Ticketer machine is configured is the, the NFC bed, the bit that opens up your credit card or your wallet, uh, is on the, the bottom of or the base of the unit. Where you scan the QR code ticket is above. So where you position the phone at the minute, um, if, the, if the ticket is in app that isn't suppressed or doesn't have NFC suppression within the app, it will open up. The, the Apple or Google wallet. Um, so in many of the bus operators own apps, they have a couple of lines of code which suppresses the NFC. 
Uh, the issue we've got with the train operating companies and the rail retailers apps is there's no need for them in their current infrastructure or current retail environment to suppress the NFC. So we're going to have to convince them just to insert a couple of lines of code and a request to Apple uh, in some cases to suppress that. But now your phone is working correctly. It's when it's when you just hover it over anything NFC, it will it will um make the wallet react to it so that's what we, where, what we need to do is convince the train operating companies and rail retailers to insert a couple of lines of code it's a bit chicken and egg we kind of need to enable some tickets in order for them to do that hence we're doing the trial the way that we're doing it but in in terms of their contracts with the dft that's one that should be very easily um solvable if they don't play ball we, yeah, we'd hope so. I think with with plus plus volumes and retail being so so low, it's not as big a priority. So it's you know we it, this is the only the only bus ticket the rail rail industry retail um, at the minute. So yeah, it's um, hopefully yeah we've got the levers we can pull, John. But I think the idea is let's get the trial in, and then once we've got something live, we can work with that. And we've got a test environment as well, um, effectively. You have have uh, raised the marketing issue with it, which is it. Uh, tends to be the best known or the least known product that the yeah it's uh, yeah absolutely it's a well-kept secret so i think we're, we're looking to use the e-ticket when we can get it rolled out uk wide as a, as a kind of a, a re-energizing or a re relaunch of, of the product because you're right it's it's been there for so long but so underused uh, and under promoted like say you walk around any rail station you struggle to find there is an agreement that there'll be a plus plus poster at every station but most stations i go and i struggle to find it <laughs> yeah, should so, be yeah. surprised. So, 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 <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Any more for Mike? No. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Thank um, you. While we've been talking about uh, Travel Line, which is uh, sort of uh, national, um, and um, Keith raised the national question um in his question about um registrations um it's probably worth um just saying that um scotland who have been um on the edges of what england and wales have been doing are uh, this year doing work on uh, policy for their equivalent of the bus open data service. And so uh, I know some of you have been involved in uh, discussions with them to help them shape some of their early thinking before they go out to wider con formal consultation um, and development of legislation um, probably next year. So this year is all about policy. Um, from the conversations that I've been having with them. So that's one to keep an eye on. Um, OK. Um, next up uh, is me talking about Christmas and bank holiday data. Um, <laughs> so um, for those of you that get involved in the nitty gritty of data, um, and trying to ingest it and understand what different suppliers are saying in trans exchange files in particular. Um, Chris, this Christmas was a little challenging for a number of reasons. Last meeting we flagged up um, a uh, problem with the way that um, the movable extra days um, are handled. So if Christmas, for example, falls on a weekend, we all get a extra bank holiday. Whoopity doo dah re to reflect the fact that Christmas um, wasn't a working day and so therefore wouldn't otherwise uh, get you any time off. Um, but um, on the years when Christmas does fall in the weekday and you get the day off anyway, um, what do you do with those extra days and it causes a bit of a problem. So there's that problem. And then there is um, the uh, challenge which people have been trying to um, understand and develop solutions for of the Christmas Eves and New Year's Eves, those days where people will run 
you know, a Sunday service perhaps or a Saturday service up till a particular point and then run the journeys out to depot. Um, and so, you know, typically by seven o'clock or something, there's no buses running. Um, that causes a bit of a problem. Um, and in BOD's data, at least, it requires an update to the data uh, every year because uh, the eaves change the days each year. Um, so um, with those problems in mind, um, we want to try and do something about them and come up with some solutions. Um, I circulated um, a um, short paper with some thoughts on um, about the problems. And the other one, of course, is uh, Scottish holidays. What do we do with Scottish holidays um, when services don't run into England or if they you know, cross border into Scotland, um, and how do we handle those? Um, that again is a problem that we want to try and address. So, um, putting together a first call next week uh, to try and get some um, wider views and consensus. Um, about what to do about it. So if you are interested in getting involved, um, then please let me know. Um, I'll just put the, so it's, ne it's 14th, uh, so a week tomorrow at two o'clock uh, for the first one. I can't imagine it will be the last. I think it will take more than uh, an afternoon to sort out. Um, but anyway, it's in there. If you want to get involved but can't make it, then drop me an email um, and I'll keep you in the loop with what we're doing and going on with it. Um, so I don't know whether anybody wants to raise any questions or say anything about Christmas and bank holidays. And David. Um, just a couple of things that on your example, Christmas Day and Christmas Day holiday are separate things in trans exchange. So therefore, the easiest way to make them work is to not allow them to be the same day. And the other one, which I hadn't realised until the other day, is that Christmas Eve is going to be as much of a problem this year as it was last year because where we've got all services that run Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we need to say that they won't run on Christmas Eve and the Tuesday only ones will. So we've got other things to change for Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's why every year there's a different problem and operators have to do things. Um, so, yeah. Mr. Batcher, if you want to put your thinking hat on, then you're more than welcome to come up with some <laughs> solutions to uh, to help. Yes, I think my original one and what to do with bank holidays might have been a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> well, get rid of them. <laughs> you know, just just declare when you run on them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, in which case we move on to Natan. Um, Dr. J unfortunately can't be with us this afternoon, so they've given me a, a bit of an update. Um, if you want to know about what the Natan project and team are doing, then uh, sign up to the newsletter. Um, because all of the events and updates are put out on that. Um, I've got this, I'll, I'll send the email address and for the Naptown help desk and the link to sign up to the newsletter round on an email uh, later. Um, and events, unsurprisingly, are managed through Eventbrite. Um, so if you subscribe to the NAPTAN uh, 
uh, channel or organization, whatever it's called in, in, in Eventbrite, then you'll get alerts when uh, new events are um, put up. But basically, the, there are two each month, um, one on a Tuesday, one on a Thursday, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and they're, they're, they're the same, but that's to capture people that can't make one because some people can make mornings and some afternoons and things like that. Um, over the last few months, though, um, there's been quite a lot of work done on the managed removal process for stops that are never going to exist ever again because the they've been built on by a new bus station or a shopping centre or something like that. Um, five key users have been onboarded into that process and two and a half thousand stops have been removed uh, as a result of that. Um, now, whilst it's only five users, that is actually the majority of ATCO areas that have been onboarded because it's people like uh, Tansy in Wales who manage all of the Welsh data and National PTI who uh, provide bureau services for a lot of authorities. Um, so most uh, ATCO areas are onboarded um, and um, the API that will enable you to find out which stops have been removed uh, is under development um, and you can get access to a beta of that if you want. Um, the other thing that the Naptan team have been doing um, is looking at bus stop accessibility, a bit of a discovery that's been going on uh, to look at what data is already available. Some of you will remember work that was done running up to the Olympics in 2012. Um, that still exists, but there's also a lot more data held in asset management systems and things like that that authorities have got. Um, and so they've been understanding what's out there and potentially how it could be used to help people understand the accessibility of a stop in the context of, of, of NAPTAN um, and the next set of meet, NAPTAN meetings, the end of this month, 30 April, uh, are going to be about what's been found as part of that process. So that sounds quite an interesting uh, call to be on. They are all recorded anyway. Um, so if you can't um, make any of them, you can watch them. YouTube later. Um, and um, yeah, that's the update from Naptan. Any questions? And I'll try and answer them. No. OK. Um, we will move on to uh, FAIRS data. Um, Stephen Penn is going to provide us with an update. Um, he's been busy over the last uh, few weeks promoting the FAIRS profile and the consultation that's been going on. So hopefully uh, we're going to find out about how that's gone. Yep, thanks, Tim. Um, I do have a little slide deck. Um, I am assuming most people on the call will have seen some of this at some point or other so um you know apologies in advance for that i, I guess um can everybody see my presentation yes okay all right so i mean uh i won't take too long to talk about the background about why we're doing this as we know netex is highly flexible and modular um so as we can see from the first day it's been published up until this point, um, there's quite a lot of variation in how each system decides to express various things with a fair product um, and various levels of detail that are being supplied. Um, so to address this in the same vein as um, has been done previously by Stuart Reynolds and Tim Rivet in terms of the trans exchange and the PTI profile, we're going to implement um, a BODS NetEx profile um, covering both simple and complex fares. And the reason why we did this is to ensure great standardization of how NetEx files are being structured, um, to ensure that there's a minimum level of data um, within each file, um, 
and then to establish standardized methods of yeah. re referencing external data sets. Yeah. As Tim said, we've been in the middle of a consultation. Um, the window for the consultation feedback closed yesterday. Um, I, mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but I mean, if I do receive something in the next 24 hours, it's probably not too late for me to take that into account when finishing up the final version. Um, so, yeah, what we did, you know, we started the, um, the consultation early February on the 20th of February, despite what it says there, 29th twice. It's actually the 20th of February with an introductory webinar and Q&A. Week later, we had a follow up um, webinar and Q&A where we talked through some of the feedback. Like I say, yesterday was the closing day for feedback. Um, any response to the consultation. Um, we've given ourselves a two week turnaround to um, make any um, updates and amendments to the profile document uh, before it's issued as a final version. Um, and then sometime in April, we're going to have a final webinar to talk about what the final version of the BODS NetEx profile looks like. And um, that date's to be confirmed um, because, of course, we've got Easter and things like that coming up. So, exactly when that's going to be, we want to make sure that attendance is as wide as possible. Um, so in terms of the documentation, you can actually access the thing that went out for the document that went out for consultation, which is version 0 0.4, which had already undergone a certain level of internal consultation with mm -hmm. ourselves in, within BODS, with the ETM suppliers and with Tim. And that can actually be downloaded on the PTIC website um, already. Um, and I think you know one of the things that we recognise from this process is that the NetEx profile documentation itself is extremely technical and jargonistic. Um, I mean, by 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 necessity, but um, you know there is a need for something a bit a bit simpler to help operators and people new to NetEx understand it a bit better. So we're going to issue a beginner's guide to NetEx as well when the main profile document is released, um, and then work up some real world product types use cases for people to look at so they can get a flavour of um, what a real product should look like. Um, so in terms of the profile itself, um, you know, the NetEx profile that we're using is not, it's not as prescriptive as the PTI profile for Trans Exchange, um, simply because fares are unregulated and come in, you know, operators have quite a lot of freedom about how they design their products um, and, and anticipating all those and modelling for them in a profile is quite difficult. So really what the NetEx profile is doing is just setting a series of minimum requirements for each NetEx file, what we expect to see. And the main areas being addressed are the file structure. Um, the first come in, um, what frames have been used in each file, because you know, uh, NetEx is, as a data standard, is contained in frames that each group together certain similar elements. Um, certain level of network requirements, um, a minimum level of tariff and fair structure element requirements, minimum level of fair products, uh, minimum level for sales offer packages, and a minimum level for fair prices. Um, when we talk about network, I mean, that can be quite a an arcane phrase i think what we mean by the network is operators services and stops um obviously in the main european netex profile those are all meant to be handled together but obviously in britain we're looking at using trans exchange um, and naptan to express those things so the bods netex profile essentially sets out how we expect those to be used so the operator must be a national operator code and it must be the same national operator code that should be used in the trans exchange being published for the equivalent services and again, a line, a line when it's expressed in a fair product in terms of defining access must include the same line ID, the equivalent um, line in the trans exchange file published on BODS, and then stops. We're expecting it to be a NAPTAN at code code at all times, except for those few scenarios where there are stops that are not in NAPTAN, and then we expect you to follow the sort of precedent established by the trans exchange PTI profile for managing um, temporary stops. Um, I'll just quickly go through sort of the main areas of feedback that came out of the consultation. I mean, it's not exhaustive, it's just some top level issues, most common ones. Um, so the biggest one was fair stages. Um, the bottom FX profile mandates that um, every time a fair stage is included in an FX file, that there must be at least one stop in it. Um, the motivation for that being that obviously the data is about, um, you, you know, presenting, well, well, I was going to say presenting for passenger information, but we mean you know anybody consuming the data needs to understand a price between two points that you can actually board an to service. Um, so the motivation there is that a fare zone must have at least one stop in. Um, what we know is obviously from 
Um, the consultation, you know, obviously Ticketer and some of the clients of Ticketer have all raised the same issue, which is obviously there are legitimate scenarios where in a ticketing machine, um, a fare zone might not include a stop, um, such as there not being a stop um, in Naptan for whatever disagreement between the operator and the local authority, or a complex route structure or a through fare, these kind of scenarios. Um, so there are legitimate reasons why, you know, um, the systems that are generating this data don't have um, stops in every fare zone. Um, I mean, I think thinking is still that that rule will stay in place and that the way it should be addressed is by removing a fare zone that doesn't have any stops in or including a non nap time point um, where that's appropriate. Um, pricing is another one. The fare price frame is quite light touch at the moment um, in terms of the board profile. Um, so we'll be expanding that a little bit, including guidance of how to define a fare triangle, you know, the cells, the rows and the columns, etc. Um, and sort of flesh out the priceable objects that we expect to see priced. Um, so that was quite a common one in the uh, feedback. File structure, another one. You know, what exactly does one file per product mean? Um, you know, um, at the moment, some of the data being published to BODs, you get bits of a product spread across multiple files. So really, when we talk about one file for a product, we're talking about we're trying to we're trying to address that specific issue. Um, but what we're trying to say is also that an adult single may be considered a ticket that's one product and is valid on multiple different services. We're saying actually that an adult single for a specific line and a direction is what we consider a fair product. Um, we would expect an adult single for the service one and an adult single for the service two to be in separate files. Um, but that's not necessarily uh, mandated by the profile, only encouraged. Uh, all the profile is really trying to do is ensure that everything related to a single fare product is in one file. Um, passenger types. Um, this is another one that was raised. You know, what we did find when NetEx was first being published that passenger types were either just not being defined at all, or if they were being defined, was just in a kind of um, string in the name which obviously is not machine readable and can't really be um, used in any meaningful sense for journey planning, etc. Um, so we have mandated that user type, which is a numerated value in the schema is used, um, but that was obviously raised. The, the point was raised that some operators have quite varied offers um, and then maybe the same user type needs to be used again and again. So just to confirm, but that will be added to the profile to state that um, user types can be used again and again as long as they have different IDs and names uh, for scenarios where you have a, a 16 to 19 year old ticket and a 21 ticket, both of which would have a user type of young person. Um, so yeah, just to clear that up, that'll be cleared up in the documentation. And then a few other issues which are more about data quality, but you know, we will be adding these as guidance points or recommendation points to the profile. Um, confusing product names, I guess what we're finding is um, a lot of the product names are in the style of um, a series of abbreviations that are not really much use for present presentation to a passenger. Um, so we're recommending that that obviously that field of we'll placing greater emphasis on the fact that that field, the name within the fair products um, is meant to actually convey something useful to a downstream passenger. Uh, and then shadow fares. This is obviously an ongoing issue. Obviously, there are good reasons why shadow fares obviously exist in the systems that are generating this data, but obviously we need to ensure that those aren't being published to bots because that's not the price um, passenger pays. So can be giving erroneous information. Um, you know, downstream system consuming the fares data. Um, so those are the sort of main areas of feedback we received during the consultation. Um, at this point, um, I guess, I'll say, are there any questions? Anything for Stephen? Well, no, no questions is good with me. Dan. Oh, Dan. We do have a question from Dan. So I thought I'd just get involved because uh, everyone's been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's leave it off too early. Uh, I was just more interested in uh, the data you've seen has been uploaded for fares so far. How much of that is kind of in line with this kind of proposed profile that we have, or how much is kind of not in line with what, what's being done at the moment? Um, well, there has been, you know, while this, I mean, obviously this profile is quite late in its issuance, and 
the the basics of that had been communicated to the major system suppliers back in summer. So what we have actually seen is that both the major suppliers, um, Ticketer and Vix, have done a lot of work um, in changing their data structures. So it's a lot easier now for operators to conform um, with most of this. I think the fair zone one is obviously the big one that probably needs resolving, um, particularly as now that Ben's team have released the Carne validation update, which was the other major thing. Um, so yeah, at this point, the data is of much higher quality um, and where it is filling the validation, a lot of the time it is the fair zones without stops in issue, um, which is a quality issue and it does need addressing. But um, yeah, compared to where we were a year ago, there's been a massive improvement in the standardization, the quality of the data and the consistency. Excellent, thanks. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think about the point now where, you know, a year ago I would have told people not to spend too much time with the FAIRS data or focus on a specific operator or I thought had high enough quality data. I think now we're in a position where, you know, people should feel a bit more confident they can actually build something with the data that's there now. I mean, it's not perfect, but we are getting there. Hmm. That's good news. OK, John. Yeah, sorry, I took me a little bar to get the... Uh layout on my laptop in my mind again rather than the uh, mobile um i'd like to look at it from the other end how much uh, choice data are you going to present with fares what i'm thinking of is that uh, you know particularly in areas where they've got into capping and the like you might be better off buying say a weekly capped even if you're going to travel for three days than take three day tickets um i think it was a feature of the fair exchange that we went to we were uh, employed by transport direct to do in the uh, mid 2000s that um we did envisage that uh, there would be conflicts between the price of, for example, uh, an operator's own day ticket and a day ticket which was interoperable, which would reasonably be higher priced. And, and that was always going to be built into the output had we got that far. Um, is this something that is still under consideration or is incorporated? Um, well, the operators are legally obliged to provide all of their fair products as data. So any variant they have, they're required to publish. Um, the data structures we use uh, are not, you know, they will tell you what each product um, costs and what access rights it gives you, et cetera. Um, but there's nothing we're going to do that will help consumers directly say, well, this product is cheaper than that one or any additional advice. That's for the data consumers and their own um, use cases and business models to decide what they want to present to the passengers. Um, I think there would be a lot of agitation, both from consumer groups and politicians, if you didn't have a standard output throughout at least mainland UK. But there is a standard output. Um, there will be a standard yes, what, what way of expressing the multi-operator ticket versus single operator ticket. I think that ultimately the, the data is downstream of the industry itself. There is a fragmented off fare offer and that's reflected in the data itself. Um, the legislation is written in such a way that all we can do is ask them to provide all of their fares as data and define how that should be done. Um, it, it's not for the bus open data program to get involved in uh, pushing certain products over others. Um, all these kind of things. No, I'm not entirely talking about pushing certain products over others. I'm talking about, you know, what is it reasonable for not necessarily BODS, but certainly DFT, and, uh, the, uh, the owner of BODS, to expect to be easily available to the member of the general public that is making a an inquiry as to what the most economical way of traveling is for a particular set of travel requirements. I mean, the data certainly allows all of that. Um, like, I mean, I think I mentioned obviously access rights of any product are definable down to stop and service and operator level. Yeah. Um, so a multi-operator ticket and a single operator ticket, which gave you the same 
um, let's say geographic rights of travel across a city or something, um, there will be a price differential and the um, the difference in operator access rights um, would be defined in a machine readable format. So anybody consuming the data is able to analyze it and work out what the best fare option is. OK, I suspect there'll be <laughs> quite a lot to follow on this. Well, this is this is the thing about open data. You know, we can. Um, you can present the data structures in such a way that it's analyzable and you can get the things you need out of it, but we can't guarantee the data consumers, the people using the data are going to ask the right questions, or present it in the right way. <laughs> John, I, th I, I, I think that. At a practical level, um, some industry groups will probably end up producing guidance on how yeah. to present data in the same way that rail have. Um, I mean, they have mandated this is the rules for presenting fair, rail fare data. Um, I don't think that can happen in the bus industry because of the way it's structured, but I suspect that some groups will start to provide advice on, um, you know, this is how you should present, you know, fares when somebody is going from A to B um, and, you know, some order of preference to, to stop the most expensive ticket being the one that's presented rather than you know the best of value um although quite what that is is probably quite hard to determine but i think that's where it'll end up um because this is open data and people can do what they want but mm -hmm. it's fair data it's the first time it's really been available in england and so yeah. therefore there's going to be some shaking down um I think you know, as the, people work out how yeah. to use it best I, I i think it's just worth remarking look, look at the relative simplicity of fares on rail by comparison and uh look at the controversy that they've caused for 20 odd years um think of the potential for the bus industry if somebody doesn't nip it in the bud and say right here's here's a specification which at least is worth starting with and let's try that for a period before we interfere too much further. And I think, you know, this the legislation is so comprehensive that it's really going to shine a light on how um, uh, how complicated the fare offer is um, in the bus network. Um, and people are going to get such a jumble of data, you know, you're going to be finding files for, you know, I don't know, whatever, off-peak military veterans tickets, yeah. things like that, you know, uh, how do you really get to what you want versus the real sort of niche tickets that you don't want to be presenting in your, your average journey planning app? Um, yeah, but this the, all this data will shine a light on that. I think it's the first time it's been done. Um, yeah, OK, yep. Keith Willis. Um, sorry, yeah, I think John made my what I was trying to make my point now earlier better, basically. But where is the passenger? Do you go to get that information um, to make sure you get it all in one place? And was there guidelines or someone going to do that, which you've answered now? But what, what would Travel Line doing with data then? I, I, I missed that bit, but would they be doing fares and making it available? And are they the kind of organisation you would say that we're going to give you the best way of comparing bus fares across the country or is that not something they were doing? I missed that bit. Well, yeah, Mike did send me a very comprehensive list of questions which would appear to be motivated by um, um, the possibility of consuming it. Um, Amy is on the call. I don't know if she can. Um, yeah, hi, um, sorry, Mike's Mike's had to go for another meeting. Yeah, so we, uh, as Mike mentioned, we're looking at uh, doing a procurement for our websites and that would include uh, specifying that we want to look at integrating the the fares data in there but I think as we've just kind of been discussing we're still having discussions on what the output might look like because every single type of fare version that there is isn't isn't something that we'd want to be displaying on every single journey plan result and also yeah with a journey plan only being uh, one sort of leg, you know, if there's, we can't say whether then that the day ticket will be best if you're onward traveling, because we don't know if you are, or if you're going on a different mode, or if you're going on the same, uh, operator or a different operator's bus or, so yeah, just trying to, these are all the kind of things that we're thinking about now about what, uh, 
things are in there would we want to surface and what things wouldn't wouldn't we want to surface and how because yeah as we've said it it does shine a light on how mm -hmm. complex yeah. it is and how many different mm -hmm. things there are in there so mm -hmm. even at the point where a consumer is going to put those things out there it's not going to be every single thing that's available and whether that it needs to be somewhere or not I don't know but that's not uh what we would be looking to do so I realized there was a business case for doing obviously affairs in bonds but um, was it not part of the review of the benefit to the public and how they would realize that benefit as part of that business case anyway uh fairs the the publishing of fairs so that it can be included and <laughs> customers can answer for the first time that how much does it cost question absolutely is part of the BODS business case but BODS is all about making it open for people to to, to use and use in different ways so you know that the presenting it side of things is outside of the scope of BODS certainly from the business case mm -hmm. Um, and then let's not forget, as a final note, we have um, we have GTFS fares conversion coming in the summer as well. So we're producing this data in, in GTFS as well, which will be a first um, for this country, I think. Certainly in the version two of fares. Mm. That'll make it more accessible to people who are presenting fares in other parts of the world already and so yeah, I mean, therefore it, might have some valuable experience in in how best to present some of this yeah and the additional benefit is obviously it'll that's, be related to the static gtfs timetables and stops so it's a it's a what well, it's a complete data set self-contained not using trans exchange and netex and naptan to piece it all together you're just using one relational data set um, yeah so hopefully that should make it easier for people so. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, John. Yeah, I think, Tim, it's probably worth saying that I, I agree with the points that have been made by the uh, the data providers about, you know, not wanting to get too deep into this. And it may well be that you'll just end up saying this will be the cost if you were making a single journey there are multi-journey tickets available or something of that kind, but there is maybe a separate work stream which we'll have to get involved with in due course, which is to say we would produce guidance on the types of fares available and how to interpret, how to uh, in in interrogate the database to get the best fare for you out of it as a consumer guide which could be flagged up with various other outputs including journey planning mm, mm, mm. yeah i think we wait to see what when people start to work uh, to consume it struggle with and where that guidance needs to come from yeah in light of that but uh, yeah, more on that, okay. I suspect, over the coming years. If not decades. <laughs> Hopefully not, John. I know you've been <laughs> doing it for decades, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, any more on fares? No, okay. Um, in which case, um i'm i'm actually gonna put in something that we did have in the agenda for a little while which dropped off um about journey planners and the quality of journey planners um one of john carr's um bugbears um as somebody that travels around um and um i think that we might be about to uh, actually start to do something about data quality and the and the results of that John you've just muted yourself by the way 
Yeah, so I'm just going to unmute myself. <laughs> Uh, yes, as you've said, Tim, a lot of this is coming up from personal experience over the past well years now. Um, initially, my concern was that the journey planning engines were getting good, clean, consistent data, uh, which of course then came back onto the providers of that data and we're all aware of um, some of the deficiencies we've had the nap time discussions etc um, but increasingly I'm finding I'm getting bad results which are because the mapping is not correct or the version of the mapping that is being used by the tool is not up to date um, and that there are inconsistent results coming from things that we all know about like grouping of stops and what have you um my feeling is that you know this isn't a five minute discussion we're talking about and what i would like to do would like to propose to uh, for short and further discussion is that maybe we might talk with dft in particular bonds um uh, with the ATCO uh, board and ourselves as, as PTIC and uh, other people that might want to be involved. And perhaps we have a half day or a day um, interactive session, whether that be online or, or whether it be in person would depend on the availability of people. I think online it may be easier to get all of the right people in the right place at the right time, as it were. Um, but that essentially what we should do is, is just talk through what the experience is, what the ideal journey planner output or outputs, plural, might look like, to what extent BODS is inclined or likely to be asked to intervene in terms of the guidance that are given on behalf of DFT. Um, and then, you know, down into the nitty gritty of what the processes are and, and what can be done to improve them. And I, I would suggest there's, there's not a lot of, no, I'll rephrase that. It's not super urgent, but I think it is something that we should be addressing as, as soon as possible, maybe late spring, early summer. Um, and that I would be perfectly happy to kick the ball off and um, talk with yourself and others, Tim, about uh, what, and in particular, DFT, um, talk about what the format of the half day or day might be get some speakers because I see this as much as being information on what current developments are looking like and what current experiences are looking like, at least at the first meeting as being, as opposed to getting into the nitty gritty of the, the journey planning process and the outputs from it. Uh, but if, if people are generally happy, I'd be prepared to talk to APCO, talk to contacts in DFT about following such an approach. Also, it would be worth, of course, getting in um, uh, transport focus and bus users as representing in different ways what the ultimate consumer is expecting. Thoughts from other people? We've, we've, we've bounced this around for a little while. Um, last few years and it's come on and off the agenda a few times. Uh, Peter. Well, thank you. Yes, I, 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 I sort of feel I'm sort of dealing with this, this issue all the time in the in the in the journey planners that, that we work with. Um, I mean, just one of the sort of comments I think would be um, quite uh, relevant is that some of the bigger journey planners are very focused on the areas where they get the footfall and where they want the quality to be really good. 
and some of the approach that we might be taking as transport professionals might be looking at the consistency across wider areas and picking up uh, problems uh, and um, certainly uh, I'm aware of quite a number of these they frustrate me a lot and um, I do I get involved in uh, in, in trying to uh, get some movement on them but I think that is a bit of one of the underlying areas and whether what what whether you're, the, the process would be hinting at some sort of legislative legislative <laughs> sort of um, um, sort of if you're going to play in this area, you must get to a certain standard or whatever. Um, you must take the, the fields and the of available and process them if, if that data is provided. I would think it'd be very hard and to get into that and whether any sort of government and authorities would really want to be um, be as prescriptive as that, given that they're getting a lot of free journey planning without public sector involvement just by letting the market uh, um, roll out some of these big products on people's phones. But they they do have this spike in this around the uh, coalescing around the areas where greater effort goes in. So I just don't know how quite we would uh, address those sort of things. Mm. OK, that's fair point. And in fact, I can just perhaps uh, respond to Peter slightly in that. I would say it's, for example, reasonable that you or I, as we do both of us travel around the country, uh, would get consistent results in terms of quality in Manchester, in Birmingham, in Glasgow, even in Belfast, etc. Um, and therefore the the answer may not be quite so much in the conventional legislation, it might be some sort of kite mark. So for example, if you consider suppliers of smart card equipment, they have to, if they're going to supply into the UK market, the mainland UK market anyway, at the moment, they have got to prove themselves to be it's so compliant. And once they've got that, then they can go out there and compete with the people that are already in the market. Now, journey planners would be slightly different, but not that much different. And that what you would say is, we will recommend that you would be providing one of the journey planners that we would recommend we looked at you. You look at as a consumer, if they've got, you know, the bots mark of approval or whatever it may be, uh, and that may be the way that we could be looking at things, and it, it could be a useful trailblazer for other things that I'm sure will come up in the future. But I, I'll just make the remark that what I'm looking at all the time is that we've got to get at least a doubling of public transport patronage to get to where we want to be in 1930, 35, whichever it is now that is the um, uh, political benchmark, uh, political milestone rather, um, and that to get to net zero, we've got to go considerably beyond that. So the more that we can do to get people to consider rationally making their trips by a non-private mode, the better and um, journey planning is is one of the first entry points that uh, a current non-user or a current adver adverse customer is, is going to uh, is going to come to followed by fares mm. 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 yeah i i certainly think that there should be a discussion about it and that would welcome a um some form of uh 
discussion and the event to understand it um, and some of the issues, particularly around different user groups and things like that, and what means good journey planning for those different groups. I think that will, I could see that being very helpful. Dan? I, I guess, I guess what's the outcome? I like the idea of like a, a mark or something that says this person's kind of approved and maybe the date stands that they update their date for every week or something like that. I think a lot of the problems with journey planners, you've got no idea how regularly the underlying data is on there. You forever see on channels that, you know, when it was Naptan last updated into Google Maps or something like that, because there's a mismatch between what you see on the ground uh, to what you see in the in the kind of raw data. But I guess the challenge here is going to be getting the big transfer, you know, these big kind of Googles and city mappers and, and people like that to change their ways. And unless they're around the table having the discussions, that becomes a harder a hard mm -hmm. thing. We could say what we want, but what's the motivation for them? If you're Google, everyone uses Google to do journey planning to start off with. That's the default go to one. But unless they're around the table having discussions about open yeah. to that dialogue, we can have all these discussions. But what's the what's the end output? You know, the DFT could say they can get they can get a mark, but most people who are using it aren't going to change the way. There is the thing that actually we want to increase people using journey plans or increase people using bus patronage if that's the real kind of aim is improving journey plan the right way to be going is it more marketing it or is it more getting you know getting the options in front of people as opposed to just improving the journey planner itself because whenever i use city map or something it kind of it does kind of work for me and it kind of gives it but it's only because i've got the mindset on that i know that city mapper will give me a route we need to get people to know actually they should be using city mapper and looking at bus as a viable alternative a very 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 short story but my wife wanted to go to kingston which is our local kind of city near us and she was going to get an uber the other day and i said why on earth are you getting an uber at the moment you can get a bus for two pounds that goes 50 meters from my front door drops you off in kingston town center you don't need to spend 25 pounds on an uber and she goes i never knew that bus kind of existed i never even knew where to look for it so we might get a journey plan that's up to date and running but if no one's going to go to it or think to go to it i think that's a problem that our industry has at the moment you yeah. know that's my two pence worth yeah yeah amy sorry that was an accident i didn't mean to put my hand up oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I, mean, I think that some of the conversations that I've had in the last six months or so about from authorities who are, you know, 10 years ago, local authorities had or at least had a stake in, in a regional journey planner yeah. um, as part of travel line arrangements and things like that. Largely, those have gone by the way they sometimes point people to travel line now point people to google or city mapper and things like that um i've had some co conversations about how do i know which ones are good or not so you know i can see where johnny's coming from um and i think some of those discussions even if it's not a kite mark it could be you know what is good you know, what's good practice um, and what should we be encouraging people to do? Um, and how can we help get some cons consistent quality to to customers? Because if you can't guarantee that you can do all the promotion you want the first time um, you get a dumb journey plan um, for a first time user, that's when they disappear and you don't see them again. Um, so, you know, they, they, I can see why, you know, we might want to have a have a think about some of this and understand some of the issues, particularly for some of the groups that might not be able to use Google or City Mapper and find it's not useful for their particular sets of needs and things like that. Um, there might be opportunities for some niche ones to support people with disabilities or particularly, you know, impairments or, or whatever. And uh, the city mappers of this world in particular, well, city mapper in particular have good relationships with uh, with the DFT. Um, and so uh, I think then we could get some of these round the table. Um, and I know Google have good relationships through um, cabinet office and things like that. I'm less certain about Microsoft, but I would assume that they would be very 
keen to get involved if some of their competitors are involved. Um, so we can always use that leverage as well. So, OK. Um, let's uh, have a chat, John, um, outside of this to yeah. get date in late April, early May, something like that. Given we've got Easter coming up. Ben. So I a little bit. I really like the idea of including bus users and transport mm -hmm. focus in this because I think operators have mentioned quite a lot that they're a bit nervous about how their data is being used out there. Um, it, it, it's not in their control anymore. And they're really worried about how passengers might get a tough time uh, from consumers that don't do a good job of it. Um, and I don't have a great answer for that, uh, but my answer is normally the market will um, succeed or fail based on the quality of the service that app provides to its passengers. Um, but I think that there's a mindset that passengers will blame the bus operator rather than the app. And I don't know how accurate that is. I think um, um, I'd like to see what some of those that are close to passengers say about that, whether the, whether the passenger that has a bad experience blames the operator on the on the bus not showing up or the app that's incorrectly told them that the bus is going to turn up or doesn't or fails to tell them yeah. that it's cancelled i'm not sure where and it might be a mixed bag it might be you know it depends on who you talk to but it, uh, i think it'd be interesting to see where the perception lies um but uh, and also whether that that idea of um passengers will just um find a different app if the app that they used doesn't doesn't meet their expectations um, um, so it'd be interesting to see what the passengers experience and behavior is like if they get a bad experience who do they who do they hold responsible and what action do they take as a result of it yeah we we know that passengers blame the bus operators so if for example there are problems with real-time displays on street it's the bus driver that gets the blame for um being early late or or whatever um if it's different to what's shown on street um and um quite a while ago now bus some bus operators were getting complaints because i turned up at this stop and the bus never showed up because they were using uh, Google and there was a bit of a data supply problem with Google and um, it was showing incorrect results. So we know that, you know, they, there's a reasonable um, number of complaints to bus companies as a result of data in different systems that's incorrect. So, you know, they, they have based it on some reality. Peter. We need to be careful with it, you know, taking the, the kite mark discussion to that because uh, journey planning is very expensive and the kite mark would probably, first of all, uh, put the pressure on bus operators own apps and the just how much they invest in the journey planners that they put in them. Um, it's, it's a really tricky one um and it's not by you know the, there's a lot of sophistication that some of the other journey planners are are going to that um that is very expensive uh when an operator is looking as to whether to put it in their app or not so difficult yeah it is it's not simple certainly yeah okay let's draw that to a conclusion that was a useful uh discussion um next up um accessible information regulations so um bus operators have to um depending on the age of their vehicle um have audio visual information on their vehicles now um if it's a shiny new vehicle um or um starting in october um retrofitting um or or retrofitting for october i should say um, so, for example, uh, buses that um, are uh, five years old, by October, they're going to have to have audio visual equipment fitted. Um, there's a lot of activity, bus operators getting retrofits with supplies and things like that sorted out. But I'm beginning to hear things um, from some authorities and operators about issues with stop names 
uh, and um, things like that, and consistency, um, which perhaps we should start to think about and get involved in um, as PTIC, seeing as that's what we're set up originally to do, is to help ensure some consistency in public transport information. Um, I don't know whether there's any other, anybody else is having those conversations and trying to address those challenges and whether we should do something. We did a bit of work for the DFT a couple of years ago as PTIC with some recommendations on stop, well, stop names to use and things like that, which is in the guidance and things like that. But that doesn't address the consistency of, of data. I don't know whether anybody wants to. David. We, we are having discussions with many operators who um, don't know that they serve stops because they call them different things uh, and they've been taking them out of bods and now they are fitting equipment that is missing those stops as they go along the road and it's now being brought to light but it it, it does have to be in an area where somebody keen enough is on that bus and saying oh it, it's not showing up because the operators don't really know um but yeah you know we we can't use an alternative naptan name so at the minute we've got the naptan name and the operator's name and the operator insists their drivers need the old names and that that is what will show up on the um in bus thing and it's only people from outside the area that are going around saying oh no it should be the naptan name right yeah 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 john th th this is this is precisely the sort of thing that um will put those that are not naturally disposed to use public transport off i i was on a bus in glasgow the other day and using city mapper and i was following where i thought i needed to be by counting the stops rather than using the stop names because roughly 50 percent of the stop names did not correspond with what was in the journey planner now i beefed on for long enough when i was with metro about the uh, the stop outside the pub in the village that went by three different former names of the pub but was never updated and was never consistent with what metro had on its files as the uh, the name of the stop anyway um and it is you know public transport is all about detail as far as the individual is concerned and if you can't get that detail right, then in the eyes of many people, your product is rubbish. Um, I think we, we probably do need to reopen these old wounds and, uh, and say, let's agree a sensible compromise between us. That probably now has to be driven by the IT. But I think the IT should be flexible enough that when the... Uh, Marks and Spencer's store that has just closed has been taken over by a little. The name of the stop be replaced as little rather than Marks and Spencer's. So others may want to add in, Tim, but this does uh, recall back to a challenge we're having with um, what challenge uh, with. Uh, Hertfordshire and getting the right information for the stops through uh, onto different platforms and it's actually become apparent through that experience that I mean it won't be news to many people on the call I guess but that in effect operators are basically running their own in some cases running their own versions of the stop names that are possibly a bit different to what's in NAPPAN and actually when those two data sources mm -hmm. Uh, don't quite uh, or you're trying to use one data source to populate everything you realize there's another one there so so Others might be able to chip in on it, but I definitely recognise that as part of a challenge. Yeah, for this and, and passengers who are on this call are dependent upon the operator supplied stop name that is not 
uh, NAPTAN compliant. And we, we spoke about that a few weeks ago, Tim. Mm, yeah. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, just on, on the NAPTAN. So that was the thing that Dr. Jay was talking about a lot on the NAPTAN call this week yeah. about stop names and updating the stop names and things like that. So it's a bit of a shout out, I think. That's more of a NAPTAN issue than a, than a journey plan issue, you know. Uh, yeah, just to maybe put more pressure on the NAPTAN team to update the importance of names um, as part of it. Yeah, yeah. It's because it's becoming yeah. much more exposed as there's more audio visual announcements on buses. Yeah, you know, exactly. Stop names you could have got away with for donkey's years because no, you know, you just asked them if the driver knew, then that was okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I you mean, described <laughs> until but, but, you got some consensus about where you were going to get off. But my view, operators are very close to the customer because their drivers go go around the whole network the whole time, and the drivers get told what what you got that sign for. It's not. It's not that at all. It's Hedges Farm or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what they believe, I think not uh, incorrectly, is that authorities are not resourced to keep their finger on the pulse and constantly update stop names and reflect local knowledge and that kind of thing. So it would be great to see something that encouraged mm -hmm. more responsiveness. NAFTA has a great system, it's being reformed, it's being improved, etc. But um, the missing link, I think, is the responsiveness of NAPTAN, which is in the hands of the authority, because DFT provide the system, but the authority update it. If the authority updated the system or had some, some motivation mm -hmm. to update the system, then we could say to the likes of passenger or any others and operators, it, look, it's all alright, you know, this thing is now responsive, it's now it's now a listening system. Mm, yeah. it, needs, um, it needs some knowledge about how to make it into a responsive system according to the different areas of the country. That, um, so I think you're absolutely right, Nick. The uh, operators are really well placed and the drivers are really well placed to know um, what would be the right, the really right name for that. Um, um, and often, Operators just don't know what to do about it. They kind of shrug, say, "Oh, well, um, not our, not our responsibility, not our problem." And but some operators do act on it. Um, but if they do act on it, they might just only update the software um, that they're using. As Theresa, you were saying, that might mean that the Trans Exchange You've gets updated. You've got two different the, versions. Yeah. You got two different exactly. versions. Yeah. And they might not take that extra step to go and have the conversation with the, the right person at the local authority. Exactly. And it's really hard to know who that is to, to get that all reconciled and all aligned so that every operator calls the same, stop the same thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's, it's a really hard mm. problem to solve, but there needs to be lots of um, conversations being ha had between the operators and the local authorities to update the data. Sometimes the operators feel a bit disconnected from it as their responsibility. Um, and so, um, and if they do, they need to know how to how, what is the right thing to do about it. Is it just, you know, to update in this software, which is not is, mm. is to update the local authority. But if so, they need to know who those contacts mm. are and what the process is. So I, th I think that there's some work to do to encourage that mm. connection between the operator and the local authority. Um, just to show what that conversation looks like and, and how it works and who is the mm. right person for each local authority. Um, so that that can yeah. be encouraged and enabled. Yeah. Um, Keith mm -hmm. has put something in the chat. Yes, there is a guidance manual for NAPTAN mm -hmm. um, about the use of side roads and main road and things like that. Um, there is. Most, mm -hmm. most of the, and, and that's still, that's mm -hmm. still valid, but actually it's not been particularly oh. enforced for many years. Um, which is part of the problem, um, but a lot of what we're talking about from a, what we call it is the landmark and things like that, which uh, is the bit that changes much more rapidly um, and potentially most useful for this sort of thing, I think. Um, right, who have we got? Peter. I don't think it's confidential, because, but but Dr. J was, was saying to us earlier this week that... Uh, planning to uh, 
reinstate the idea of a single of, of a contact at the local authorities and a, an easy way um, to address that feedback. Certainly, uh, we've been asking for that and uh, we're being reassured that that's uh, that's coming because um, when you have a question about uh, something and you, you want to change, it's really good if, you, if it's an easy way to get it um, just logged into the system and uh, go back to the right contact, then they can consider it and hopefully make some improvements. So I thought that was good news. Mm. Mm. Yeah, John, briefly, because we yeah. need to wrap this up. Just to say that it's all very well saying, yes, let's have a contact at each local authority and that'll solve it. But if that contact is going to be told by uh, head of department and the county treasurer that there ain't no resources to go out and do this sort of survey, do that, then all you've done is get another sympathetic ear to uh, moan into. Uh, and really, I think the message has got to get back to the politicians that if they want these systems to be effective and to work well and to deliver policy objectives, they've got to recognise that the local authorities have got to have the relevant resources. Mm -hmm. End of sermon yet again. <laughs> it's yeah. just a very final point, Tim, on that, which is we didn't even know this was a problem until we were trying to solve this thing for Hertfordshire. So how it, you could have people that are there to do it, but unless anyone knows that there really is a difference between those two things, that there's, there's a sort of exercise of comparison between what, an example, this case, mm. passenger, it, it, I'm not, same question or wrong in this case but in, in this particular one it's showing on uh, a website it's showing that information it's only because we were trying to address this particular problem we discovered this so it's possibly a bigger issue and without some way of finding that out we probably don't know how yeah. big it is and, and it is worth noting that Hertfordshire is one of the better authorities in terms of the resources it still has available mm. yeah okay thank you that was a good uh discussion um EU standards development, um, it's in a bit of a quiet phase at the moment. Um, various things like NetEx are sort of um, in sort of the limbo land between um, the, the current version being formally approved and the next phase of work to uh, add in um, um, control actions and, and things like that. Um, that probably the most interesting bit is a bit of work that's starting to try and produce a common glossary to make sure that everybody is using the same language um, as part of um, some of the national access point work that is going on um, in the European Union um, and that is looking to try and get some consensus about um the definitions of words and phrases not just within public transport and um you know between bus and rail which is an interesting enough challenge but also uh, across road and walking and cycling so that um it's easier to understand how things might interoperate in future um so yeah um that's going to be an interesting challenge for those people involved in that um, I am trying to stay out of it. <laughs> um, <coughs> bus Centre of Excellence. Um, one thing, if you're not a member of the Bus Centre of Excellence, go onto the website, um, sign up for the newsletter. That gets you membership. The reason I'm asking this uh on saying this is um if you are not member of a professional body being a member of bus center of excellence means that you can apply for uh this year's membership to um ciht for free uh, sorry those of you that are C uh, cilt <laughs> members um but um <laughs> That's um, if you want to join CIHT, then uh, become a Bus Centre of Excellence member and mm -hmm. you get your first membership first year free. Um, so if you want to get involved in that sort of thing, that's worth doing. Um, there are no new issues that have been raised with me. 
um, which then uh, gets us to the point of um, next meeting is 6th of June. Um, hopefully see you there. And um, if is there any other business? No, in which case, oh, John. Yeah, yes. sorry that uh, this was something you were discussing when uh, I was uh, moving from the uh, mobile to the uh, laptop. But I think it would be very helpful and very much appreciated by community transport organisations if we could ensure that as much information on their Christmas and New Year services is flagged up on the various sites that are using bots um to you, you 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 know really as much of the community service as um anything that is going to have uh, profound results but i think it would be very much appreciated if we did that well we will certainly in the conversations about how to manage christmas bank holiday data make sure that we factor in any particular requirements of community transport and whether that where they've got differences and things you know in, in, in some areas there's a relationship has developed between the local operator and the uh, community transport operators in the area that um, there is already local publicity of that kind but again the more that we can uh, in the difficult periods flag up the alternatives the better yeah yeah okay any other business in which case thank you all have a good rest of the day and see you in june or before on a non petit call <laughs> thanks so much tim thanks everyone Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Thanks for steering us through it. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, he was leaving. Not to go. Oh, it's the wrong button. button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Cheerio.